The buckshot riddled deer crossing sign waved as Mike's Ford Escape SUV rumbled down the dirt road. There was nothing to see but trees, ditches, and the occasional squirrel. It had been like that for hours. A lone farmhouse here, an abandoned gas station there. The scenery had swapped from trees to open fields, seemingly at random. Mike had been forced to drive. His girlfriend Shelly didn't feel comfortable driving long distances. A convenient excuse if he'd ever heard one. Mike wasn't fond of long drives either for that matter. But Shelly was his high school sweetheart. He could never turn her down. Penny and Carlos, sitting in the back seat, had been arguing since Mike and Shelly had picked them up. They were quiet for now, but only because they were asleep. The incessant banter would resume the moment one of them opened their eyes. Mike was sure of it. This cottage trip was supposed to be a fun getaway, but so far it had been nothing but a headache. They were coming up on the five-hour mark of a seven-hour drive. Mike gripped the steering wheel harder in an attempt to relieve some of his pent-up frustrations. Up ahead, Mike saw the first sign that wasn't watch for wildlife or preventing forest fires is everyone's responsibility. This break in the usual signage was a welcome sight. The white letters on the green background read, St. Teresa, next left in one mile. Mike glanced down at his gas gauge and realized he would need to fill up and soon. He looked over at Shelly, who was deeply engrossed in a show she had downloaded on her phone. Her blonde hair shone in the sunlight that emanated through the trees. She was growing more gorgeous every day. I hope the drive isn't much longer. My back is killing me from sitting so long. Shelly thought as the credits rolled across her screen. I would offer to drive, but it's going to get dark soon. Mike looked back to the road and put the turn indicator on as he pulled over to the unpaved shoulder. What's wrong? Shelly asked, taking her eyes from her phone and looking to the road ahead. Nothing, he assured her. We're just low on gas. I'm just seeing how far the next town is. The St. Teresa turnoff is less than a mile away, but the GPS says to keep going straight and to bypass it. We should follow the GPS, Shelly replied, turning her attention back to her phone as she selected a new episode to watch. Right, Mike responded as he looked at the digital map. Shelly shrugged. He's not listening again, she thought and shook her head. Mike was fiddling with the GPS map in an attempt to unzoom and see the area around them. By his estimate, it would be another hour before they reached the next town using the GPS's route. St. Teresa was less than 20 minutes away from this left turn coming up. No way they could go in an hour and not tank up. Mike had an idea. He dragged his fingers across the GPS map and set it to go through St. Teresa instead. The route recalculated. The estimated time of arrival switched from 9.15 p.m. to 8.12 p.m. Mike smiled. This new route would save them an hour. They could get gas and arrive sooner. Win-win scenario if I'd ever seen one. Mike thought as a boyish grin appeared on his face. He pulled off the dirt shoulder of the rural highway and began to drive down the unevenly paved road. He drove for a minute before turning on his indicator, signaling that he was turning left. As he made the turn down the road that led to St. Teresa, Shelley asked, Where are we going? The lovely town of St. Teresa to get some gas. GPS says going this way is going to save us an hour. Mike almost sang the words, still flying high from his discovery. We should just stay on the GPS's original route. They put it that way for a reason, Shelly said, her eyes wide as she cocked her head. I've never heard of St. Teresa. Doesn't sound like a great place. I'm sure gas is way overpriced. Always is in these small town communities. 
Mike glanced at her and noticed she was doing her puppy dog pout. She thinks she's going to convince me to keep going and bypass this town. That face she does always works, but not this time. This time I know I'm right. He adjusted his hands on the steering wheel before saying, The GPS just sets it that way to make us stop in more towns so we spend more money. Besides, we need gas. We won't make it to the next town if we follow its original route. Are we there yet? Penny's voice sounded from the back. She was awake, and Mike bit his lip, letting out a quiet sigh as he did so. She's up. Oh, joy. Penny stretched her arms and thought, If I have to sit in this car any longer, I am going to literally scream. If we were there, Mike wouldn't still be driving, Carlos said as he looked out the window. Mike watched as Penny gave Carlos the finger and then put her earphones in. Mike shook his head and was glad the cabin they rented had two separate bedrooms with thick wooden doors. Not that Mike wanted to stay inside all week. No, he planned to sit out on the porch and watch the lake ripple in the wind, maybe go kayaking. He wasn't sure. He just needed to relax. This past year had been especially hard. Being a minimum wage security guard at the Kalu Valley Mall wasn't the easiest of gigs. He'd been applying to police jobs all over the state for a solid eight months now and had heard nothing back, with the exception of two rejection letters. He needed a win, and this cottage trip would be it. The hardest decision he wanted to make this week was what type of beer he would drink on what particular day. He needed this vacation and Penny and Carlos's drama wasn't going to ruin it. He headed down the dirt road and felt the wheel jerk in his hand. This section of the roadway was much bumpier. While the previous rural highway hadn't been smoothed by any stretch of the imagination, this was more noticeable. The road continued like this for a few minutes before seeming to even out. You should get a Terrain or Acadia. GM makes the best SUVs. Carlos said from the back seat. I can get you a deal. Forget employee pricing. How about the family discount? He added after a second, when Mike had failed to respond. Noted, Mike said. Is this guy really trying to sell me a car while I'm on vacation? These sale types just don't quit. How many times so far today? Two? Three? Take a hint, man. After a moment of realizing how rude he sounded, he then added, Thanks, I'll... I'll try to keep that in mind. I like this, though. Carlos made it no secret that he worked as a car salesman at the biggest GM dealer in this city. Every opportunity he had, he flaunted this trait about himself. Mike had tried to be nice, but found Carlos to be a little snotty and uptight. Perfect for Penny. Shelly and Penny had been friends since college. Penny was a nice enough girl with a good fashion sense and was easy on the eyes, but had problems holding on to a man. Carlos was heads and tails above the last guys she had been seeing. At least Carlos worked. Carlos patted Mike on the shoulder and said, Just think about it. He leaned back in his seat and thought, <laughs> If the guys in the dealership saw me in a Ford... I'd be a laughing stock. Keep up the pressure, I'll get him eventually. He looked out the window and watched the trees as they passed by. He clicked his tongue as the dullness of the trip set in once again. This drive is killing me. Penny took out an earphone and started talking to Shelly about some work drama she'd been dealing with. Mike could see Carlos rolling his eyes and pushing himself further back in his seat. He looked like he couldn't be more bored if he tried. By the time they reached the town, the sun was disappearing behind the trees. It would be dark soon. St. Teresa itself wasn't much to look at and consisted of just a main street with several roads that forked off to either side. In the distance, past the main strip of the town, lay a large body of clear water. Small islands sat scattered in the middle of the lake 
adding touches of green and brown to the site. The Ford Escape turned and headed down the hill that led into town. It's beautiful, Shelley said as she marveled at the pristine waters. She raised her phone and took a few photos. We should have gotten a cottage here, Penny added. She sounded innocent though, but the comment had dug its way under Mike's skin. You pick the spot where you're going to. It took days to decide. Now after seeing one lake, you change your mind. He thought as he bit his lip, eyes wide. Shelley seemed to sense this and said, Don't be silly. The one on Nectar Lake is way nicer. You said you loved the pictures you saw, and it's much more private. She looked into the back seat at Penny as she spoke, while also touching Mike's knee. Hear that, hun? More private, Penny said as she ran a finger along Carlos's arm. Yeah. Real pretty, Carlos responded, completely disinterested. Why do you gotta be such a stick in the mud? They won't want to hang out with us anymore. Mike sighed. The ceasefire between them had ended, and their eternal war had begun again. Shelly adjusted her hair in the sun visor mirror as she thought, Here they go again. Hopefully they settle down when we get there. The main drag was empty of pedestrians though a few trucks were parked neatly along the side of the street. Each had faded paint and caked on mud sprayed across their wheel wells, adding to their overall aging appearance. Mike's SUV passed a small family-owned pharmacy on the right. Looking in as they drove by, he saw a red-haired girl standing behind the counter, explaining something to an elderly gentleman. The girl looked up from the bottle she held and did a double-take as the dark blue Ford Escape passed by. The elderly customer noticed that she was staring out the window and turned around to look as well. His eyes studied the SUV just as it finished moving across the wide windows of the pharmacy. Mike looked forward to the road once again. That was ominous, Shelley said as she turned her attention back to the setting sun. She noticed the strange looks they received as well. Maybe they just like the car, eh, Carlos? Mike said, chuckling to himself. He looked in the rearview mirror and saw that Carlos couldn't have cared less. He was too busy flicking the window control button on his armrest in an attempt to occupy himself. As the SUV rumbled through the small town, Mike noticed that all the stores appeared to be closed or very close to closing. His spirits lifted when he saw a gas station at the end of the main drag, right by the lake. Its lights were still on, and the rusted pricing sign was backlit, displaying quite an inflated price for gas. The Ford Escape pulled up to the pumps just as the sun set behind the trees on the far side of the lake. A calm darkness swept over the town. Mike got out of the vehicle and unscrewed the gas cap. He pressed the button on the pump and heard a beep coming from inside the building. The sound slipped through the two dusty glass entrance doors that watched over the station. Mike waited patiently for the cashier to activate the pumps. He waited and waited then waited some more. The insistent beeping continued. The attendant never came. Mike sighed removed his hand from the nozzle and walked over to the glass doors. Stuck to the glass on the right was a sign that displayed store hours. Every day, the times were the same, 7 a.m. until sunset. Mike looked at the now dark sky. Great, he said to no one in particular. Mike pulled on the door handle, but it refused to budge. The station was already closed for the night. Despite the locked door, a come in, we're open sign hung on the left glass panel. The sign depicted a jolly little blue mechanic who stood underneath the welcoming words of the sign. Directly beside him was a tow truck in the same shade of blue. The mechanic held a wrench in his hand and wore a grin on his face, clearly depicting a man who enjoyed his work. Mike took his eyes off the sign and grounded his teeth, trying to figure out what he was going to do next. 
Maybe there's another gas station in this one-horse town. The wind began to pick up behind him, but he didn't pay it any mind. He was about to walk away when he saw a pudgy, balding man in an oil-stained golf shirt approach the counter from the back room. The station attendant headed over to the beeping computer and held his hand over the button when he saw Mike's face in the glass. The attendant's brown eyes widened and his enormous lips parted in a slack-jawed expression. He looked around his empty gas station, sweat appearing on his wrinkly forehead. The attendant raised a fat finger and started to yell for Mike to leave. He gestured a few times by waving his hand in the air, the universal sign for get lost. Seeing that Mike was not budging, the greasy man came around the counter and walked towards the glass doors. Mike took a precautionary step backwards and clenched his fists. The attendant came up to the glass and Mike could see that the attendant was out of breath from the short walk over from the counter. Get the fuck out of here. We're closed, the attendant said, the heavy smell of bourbon slipping through the cracked seal between the glass doors. Look, man, I just need some gas. I'll slip in an extra 20 just for your time, Mike said as he rubbed his head thinking. I can't believe I'm going to give this trailer trash asshole more money, but I need the gas. We're closed. The man grabbed the open sign and flipped it. The happy little blue mechanic was swapped for a red version of himself driving home for the night in his matching red tow truck. The words, closed, please call again, hung over the scene. The attendant walked to the register, grabbed the key from the closed tray, and turned off the lights inside. He waddled to the back room, and Mike lost sight of him. Douche! Mike spat between the glass doors. The words echoed off the walls of the now dark building. Now what? Mike thought as he stood under the overhead lights of the station. The yellow bulbs buzzed angrily as flies zipped around them. A cool breeze ran up the street, causing the trees to sway. That early September weather had arrived, and it was even colder up here, five hours north of home. Mike walked to the car and stepped into the driver's side. What was that about? Shelly asked, flicking a strand of hair from her eye. Some hick who won't sell us gas? Mike said as he started the engine. Well, what now? Carlos asked from the back, looking out the rear window as he spoke. Um, well... Mike sputtered, trying to come up with a plan. He had to remain in control. If I can't keep this simple situation in hand, how can I ever hope to be an officer? He cleared his throat and continued. <clears throat> this town's gotta have someone who keeps a jerry can or something around. Let's head down the road there and see if there's a mechanic or a police station or something, Mike said, speaking the only plan that came to mind. I don't know, Mike. Let's just get out of here, Shelly said, her voice trembling. She tugged on her sweater as she thought. These northerners are weird. I don't like this. Mom always said so too, and now I get why. We don't have a choice. We won't make it to the next town if we go the way the GPS originally wanted us to. Mike replied as he chewed on his fingernails, thinking, I knew we should have stopped for gas in Whitevale. An hour and a half back, but we were making such good time. He was kicking himself now. Let me see that. Shelly leaned over and grabbed the GPS from the windshield, pulling it to her lap. She moved her finger around the map. There, she added after a few seconds. There's another town on this route, maybe like half an hour away. We can still stay on this route, no backtracking, and still get to the cottage earlier than we thought. Markov's point. Sounds nice. Please, Mike, I just... I don't like it here. Yeah, Mike... Penny chimed in from the back seat. Let's go to Markov's Point. It must have a gas station. Probably nicer people, too. Let's try my plan for a minute, Mike said as he looked at the gas gauge again. The low fuel light hadn't come on yet, but it would soon. He didn't think they had enough gas to make it another half hour, especially on these dark dirt roads. 
The Ford Escape was silent, but Mike could tell Shelly hated this idea. She sat with her arms folded across her purple Nike sweater. At least Carlos and Penny were quiet for once. The SUV pulled out of the gas station and moved to a street directly across. The lake came into view immediately, on their right side. Mike looked over just in time to see a shooting star headed over the mountain range on the far side of the clear water. The girls marveled at the rippling water, serving as a nice distraction from the present situation. Carlos, though, couldn't have cared less. If it wasn't a product owned by General Motors, it wouldn't hold his attention. Despite his total lack of interest, however, it was Carlos who pointed out the objects a moment later. What's that? He said as he gestured to the sky directly above the lake. Three lights floated in a triangle, small dots hundreds of feet in the air. Must be a constellation, Mike said. He took his eyes from the road to study the orbs over the lake before adding. Remember, there's a lot less light pollution here. More stars for us to see. He focused on the road once again and continued to drive down the side street across the gas station. Three of them in a pyramid? That bright. I've never seen stars like that, Carlos said as he sat back in his seat and looked out to the dark tree line. And what? You've seen every constellation, have you? Penny said as she folded her arms. I didn't know you were Mr. Astronomer all of a sudden. Carlos didn't say anything to defend himself. He just sat there thinking, Why does she have to give me a hard time constantly? I wonder how deep that lake is. And I wonder if she knows how to swim. The side street had a few houses dotted along it each sitting on enormous lots that were much bigger than anything you would find in the city. Every property was lit up, their owners already home for the night, and Mike could see people moving around inside. Some were eating dinner, some watching TV. Everyone seemed pretty normal. He licked his lips and thought, Must have just been that one Neanderthal at the gas station. No reason to condemn this entire town. A few people looked up from their meals and watched his SUV drive by. Their eyes followed the vehicle as it moved down the road, unblinking. Mike shivered as they stared at him. Penny noticed the peculiar looks as well and said, I'm starting to think we aren't welcome here. Mike looked to the end of the road and saw a sign that read, Aces Repair and Tire Depot. He looked over to Shelly, his face already lighting up. See? He said proudly. He stepped on the gas and accelerated. Despite his calm exterior, he wanted to get out of this town as well, preferably as quickly as possible. Mike pulled up the gravel driveway of the repair shop. Several small windows in the garage doors revealed that a few lights remained on inside the vehicle bay. A single illuminated bulb sat over the main door, but it was relatively dim. As the vehicle approached the aging building, the Ford's headlights picked up someone just as they walked behind the building, disappearing from sight. Someone's still here, Mike's voice cracked as he spoke. He pulled up to the front door, turned off the engine, and exited the vehicle. You're not going by yourself, are you? Shelly asked. Her eyes were wide. Well, yeah, I... Mike replied as he leaned over and looked through the open driver's side door. No, you ain't. We're all coming, Shelly insisted as she looked back at Penny and Carlos. Right, guys? She added after a second of silence filled the Ford Escape. Carlos sighed and Penny looked around the back seat dumbfounded like Shelly was talking to someone else all of a sudden. She unbuckled her seatbelt as she thought, she wants us to go into that creepy repair shop? Mike moved his head so he could see in the back seat. Well, since you're coming, Carlos, pass me that flashlight in the front pocket of the bag beside you. As he spoke, he pointed to Carlos's right shoulder. 
Carlos did what he was told, but couldn't resist saying, Just use your app on your phone. What do you need a flashlight for? Mike shrugged and grabbed the cheaply assembled torch that Carlos retrieved from the bag. Carlos wiped his nose and adjusted his short, gelled hair before opening his door and exiting the escape. Penny was last. She took her time putting on a pair of pink gloves and a yellow wool hat. God forbid she catches a chill, Mike thought as he felt his back tense with impatience. The group trotted along the gravel driveway and walked around the back of the building where the person had last been seen. Carlos had taken his own advice and was using his phone as a flashlight. He was hovering behind the group and kicking some stones as he walked. Christ, he's a slow walker, Mike thought. They rounded the building and Mike's flashlight picked up no one at all. A pile of tires, some scrap metal, and a rusted out 1987 Honda Civic sitting on blocks were all that were present. The cool breeze flicked off the lake and caused the unmowed grass to sway against the shins of his jeans. Mike looked out at the lake and noticed the pyramid of lights had disappeared from the sky. He made a mental note of this and took a few steps towards the ratty Honda. Let's get out of here, guys, Penny said, clutching her arms. Her beige autumn vest and thin white long sleeve shirt offered her little warmth against the wind. A flapping of wings caused the group to turn their attention to the roof. A flock of at least a dozen crows took flight into the sky. The gigantic, plump, mangy looking things cawed as they ascended. Mike turned his attention forward as he heard the trees and bushes sway in the wind. A distant splash in the lake caused Penny to yelp, putting Mike on edge. Did anyone else notice those crows were the only animals we've heard since being in this town? Shelly said as she clutched Mike's arm. No crickets, no chipmunks, no cats, not even a dog barking. Mike hadn't noticed. He was too busy thinking about his vehicle and his lack of fuel. But now that Shelly had pointed it out, she was right. This town was eerily quiet and completely devoid of wildlife with the exception of those crows, which were gone now too. Look, I hate to be a broken record, but let's just get out of here, Penny said, her voice shaking as she spoke. Can we just cast somewhere else? Literally anywhere else, she thought as she listened to the sounds of the lake. Right, Mike replied. He turned around and noticed that the group now consisted of three. Carlos was nowhere to be seen. Where? Where's Carlos? He asked, trying to sound innocent so as not to scare Penny. He didn't want to have a repeat of the ski trip two years prior, when Earl, the unemployed wreck of a man that Penny was dating at the time, had vanished in a drug-induced stupor. What? Penny shrieked. Her eyes widened and she scanned the various piles of junk behind her. Do you think he's screwing around? Shelly asked, her nails burrowing into Mike's blue Adidas sweater. No, I... I don't think he is, Mike replied as he pulled Shelly behind him and slowly approached Penny. The girl's eyes were filling with tears. She took a few steps forward and flinched when Mike put an arm around her. Carlos? Penny called into the cold night. The only reply was the slight breeze over the lake. Carlos, Mike called out, even louder than Penny's little voice. The wind was picking up by the second. The trees in front of the group swayed violently in the breeze. The water rippled against the rocks down the hill from the repair shop. Mike looked to the tree line, and that's when he saw the figure standing there looming. It was perfectly still. He thought his eyes were playing tricks on him at first, and he squinted, but it changed to nothing. Someone was there, and he was sure it was no illusion. Carlos? Mike's voice quivered as the word came out. Mike raised his flashlight to the figure. The bulb shattered 
the moment the light illuminated its black, spindly chest. Glass rained down on the dew-covered, long grass. Penny screamed. The figure staggered forward towards the group. Mike didn't dare stay put. He dropped the flashlight to the ground and screamed at Shelley to move before pulling her behind him. Penny screamed again as the figure continued to drudge forward, aiming for her. Disproportionate, lanky black arms were coming out of the tree line. Mushy, moist footsteps sounded off in the soggy dirt under the trees. Mike adjusted his grip and grabbed Penny by the vest, pulling her along with his left hand. Shelly was gripped tightly in his right. Penny snapped out of her screaming trance and followed. The group ran toward the far side of the shop, the opposite way they had come. They rounded the corner and headed toward the gravel parking lot where Mike's Ford was waiting to take them to safety. The wind was ripping through the trees beside them, and the footsteps continued behind, slow and monotonous. It was coming. They reached the end of the garage and came out onto the gravel lot. Mike's beautiful blue vehicle was still parked, but there was something else, something that stopped them dead in their tracks. A second figure, dark as the night that shrouded them, it stood at the driver's side door of the escape. A misshapen hand ran along the hood of the car. Mike shrieked and the figure looked to the group. It moved from the far side of the hood and came at them. The way it moved, so unnatural and clumsy. Penny wailed and both girls broke free from Mike's trembling hands. Penny ran into the trees behind them, her cries echoing off the old and silent branches. Shelley took off to the left and sprinted down the street, giving the advancing figure a wide berth. Mike panicked and pivoted as he decided to follow Penny instead. Her screams of terror would give away her position, and she would get herself caught. Mike also knew he could at least catch up to her. Shelley had been a track and field champion her whole life, and there was no way he would reach her. Mike ran into the tree line, branches and leaves hitting his face. He could feel blood forming at a fresh cut below his right eye. Twigs behind him snapped as he moved deeper into the woods. It was coming. Shelley ran down the road, yelling out for help. The repair station was a good stretch behind her, but she didn't dare look back. Don't you dare look behind you. Keep running. Keep running. She thought and focused on a house that sat on the right side of the road. The porch light was on, a white picket fence surrounding the property and a tire swing hung from a twisted tree on the front lawn. They must have children. They will help she thought, hoping and praying they would. Shelley ran up the driveway, but just as she was about to enter the cobblestone path, the porch light turned out. Immediately, it was followed by the warm indoor lights going dark as well. No, 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 she screamed. Help! I need help! She reached the maroon-painted door and slammed her fists on it. She punched it, the wood made her hand ache. No answer. She turned around and looked towards the repair shop. One of them was gliding down the road after her, the moonlight offering little illumination to its finer details. Its backward legs were like nothing she had ever seen, nor would she ever care to describe them. It looked like a man, but its arms were long and jagged. Its legs warped and twisted. The specter's head was an empty pit of darkness that consisted of no feature one could recognize as human. The figure bobbed up and down as it moved along the road toward her. Shelley let go of the doorknob and ran across the front lawn. She leapt over the picket fence and moved up the road. Another home sat peacefully on the left, a short distance ahead. The porch light was on as well, 
and she could see lights illuminating the main room. She ran across the road and straight up to the window. A man sat on a gray recliner, drinking a Coors Light from a can as an 80s action film played on the TV in front of him. Shelley hammered on the glass and called out for help. She knew the man could hear her as he had jumped slightly in his recliner as she hit the window. But he did not turn his head or get up to assist the woman who was pounding at his window. He just stayed there, studying the television. Shelley could tell he was watching her in his peripherals, pretending not to notice. The man grabbed the remote from the wobbly wooden end table beside him and turned up the volume to first blood. She slammed on the glass again, but realized what he was doing. Drowning her out, muffling her cries. She turned around and looked down the road. It was coming. Shelley took off behind the house. It was almost at the front lawn. It would catch her if she headed down the road again, and she was getting tired. Her heart felt like it was going to beat out of her chest. She ran through the backyard, the grass swaying in the night breeze. It was a single shed sitting in front of the tree line behind the house. She moved toward it, hoping to lose her pursuer in the dark forest. Shelley turned the corner of the shed and ran face first into a figure. She screamed, but the figure covered her mouth to muffle the sound. She raised her hands and went to claw at the attacker when she noticed the blue Adidas sweater the figure was wearing and looked up. It was Mike with his freckled face and short brown hair. There was a cut just under his right eye. Mike saw Shelley's eyes recognize him and let go of her mouth. Penny was clutching onto his left arm, her small fist cocked back to defend herself. Go! We gotta go! Shelley cried. It's right behind me! Mike grabbed her by the arm, and as the group ran into the woods, Mike said, There's a path. We lost the thing from the tire place in the trees back here. If we keep following the trail, it looks like it'll take us to the main street. Maybe we can find help. No one will help. I called and called, Shelley said, hardly able to speak the words. The three of them ran up the forest path and turned right. Shelley could see the lights of the main drag that Mike had mentioned. She wasn't sure how they were going to get back to the escape, but this felt much safer. They charged through the woods and were almost at the road when Mike saw movement in front of them. Something ran from the main street and entered into the tree line ahead, heading toward them. This figure moved with a more natural gait and was shorter than the others. Mike grabbed Penny and Shelley and forced them to stop. The group stood still and in silence, watching as the figure stopped on the path ahead a moment later. It was dark, almost impossible to see, but Mike could tell this figure was a person, specifically a man by the way it carried itself. He appeared to be wearing clothing, something the other figures lacked entirely. Come here, the stranger whispered. Shelley stepped forward. No, Shelley, he might be one of them, Penny said, her voice on the verge of tears. She had called out louder than she should have. If any of them were nearby, they would hear her. Shelley took another step forward, thinking, It's okay. It's okay. Finally, someone who will help. Shelley, Mike said. I promise you, I'm not with them. The man's voice cut through the darkness in a low whisper. But if you don't let me help you, I will leave. Mike could see the man was holding a shotgun. If he wanted to kill them, he would have done so already. Mike followed Shelley's lead, and Penny reluctantly joined them. The man gestured down to a ditch beside the trail and slid into it. Shelley followed without hesitation. She's always so trusting, Mike thought as he squinted. 
trying to see if the ditch was safe to enter. Shelley motioned for him to follow, and he did so a moment later. Penny jumped down last. They don't move so good in the woods, the man said, pointing his shotgun to the top of the ditch. I couldn't stand by and let them take more. Not after the last time. I heard your screams. I had to act. Why doesn't anyone else help? Shelley asked, trembling. What are those things? Penny squeaked as she clutched onto Mike. The man ignored Penny and directed his answer to Shelley. They don't take anyone from town. They only take visitors and passers-by. I don't know why that is, but that's all they want. The only residents to go missing are those that help the ones already marked, giving them shelter, a ride out of here. Anything that interferes with their plans. I'm putting myself at risk now, just talking to you. So, they don't take anyone from the town who doesn't help? Just visitors? Shelley asked. Right. The man adjusted the grip on his shotgun. And they only come out at night. Why haven't you people moved if you knew about these things? Mike asked, his voice a mix of horror and disgust. Some folks did. That population sign used to be a whole lot bigger. But within three weeks or so of moving away, they all disappeared. And I mean gone. We're talking people moving cities, and in some cases states. Hundreds of miles. They would move in, unpack, then disappear. Whole families. Never found. These beings are keeping us controlled like a little playhouse or science experiment. We play by their rules, and we don't get hurt. How long has this gone on for? Shelley asked. Too long. Too many people taken. But long enough that... A twig snapped in the distance. The stranger gritted his teeth and ceased speaking, his eyes searching the dark trees all around. The group sat silent in the muddy ditch for a long time. Only the sound of rustling leaves could be heard. The stranger took a deep breath and broke the silence. Look, you kids gotta go. I have some fireworks in my house. I'll set them off and set them off in the old campground up the block. When they go off, get to your car. The fireworks should distract them long enough for you to get out. He stood up and went to exit the ditch but stopped for a moment. He turned and said, Last thing, whatever you do, do not stop in Markov's point for any reason. And remember, if you see the crows, it's too late. He got up, checked both directions of the path, and was off in the night towards the main strip. What now? Penny asked. Didn't you hear him? We wait for the fireworks, Mike said through gritted teeth. Don't snap at her. Shelley bit back. She's just scared, just like you. She stroked Penny's long brunette hair as she thought. I have to keep her calm. If she gets hysterical, they'll find us. The three of them waited for a long time. Penny asked a couple of times about Carlos, but every time Mike and Shelley dodged the question. The woods were silent, with only the occasional howl of wind and branches crashing against one another. At one point, a car alarm on the main drag sounded off. Its loud beeping raised everyone's already high adrenaline levels, until the owner switched it off a few moments later, from the safety of their living room, no doubt. The noise ceased, and the remnants of the alarm trickled off into the lake, fading into the night. Mike was just about to give up hope on the stranger when he heard the screeching of a firework as it flew up into the air and exploded. The trees blocked the sight, but Mike knew the signal when he heard it. 
Shelly stood up first. Come on, come on. That's it. Mike charged up the slope of the ditch and scanned the trail. No movement, just blackness. Shelly and Penny followed behind as the group ran toward the ford. The echoes of Roman candles, screaming memes, and dancing dragons sounded off behind them. The woods were still. Even the wind had died down. Mike and Penny tripped many times in the dark, but Shelly maintained her footing. They came to the end of the path and saw that it overlooked the repair shop. Mike's SUV was visible, sitting quietly in the stone driveway. The coast looked clear. Mike could see on the horizon to his left the last of the fireworks exploding, a green flash of light and a single crack, followed by silence. They didn't have much time. The group ran across the long grass and came to Mike's vehicle. The Ford beeped as he unlocked the doors and the three of them jumped inside. Mike started the engine, and the fuel warning indicator illuminated in an instant. His eyes widened at the orange glow of the light, but he quickly pushed the thought to the back of his mind. His priority was getting far away from this lakeside town. Mike set the car to drive and stepped on the gas. Rocks flew from under the tires. He turned the wheel and swung the SUV around. The vehicle motored up the street. The caution, watch speed, children at play, signs were for decoration. There was only one speed, and that was get the hell out of there. Mike could have sworn people were watching them from the safety of their homes, but he didn't dare look. The Ford came up to the main drag and turned right, the tires squealing as he took the corner and blew through the stop sign. We're going back the way we came, right? Out of this town? Shelley asked, but it sounded more like an order. Abso fucking lootly, Mike yelled as he straightened up the vehicle to get it back to the right side of the road, narrowly avoiding crashing into a parked and rusting Dodge truck. Penny was crying in the back seat, either about Carlos or about the Bings, but a combination of both was most likely. Mike raced through the main road and up the hill that overlooked the sleepy town. Upon reaching the top, the Ford made a quick right, leaving St. Teresa behind. The sounds of their exhaust echoed off the still water. The Ford thundered down the road that led home. Too fast, Mike. We'll go into the ditch. Slow. Shelley was cut off as two figures stood in the middle of the road, a little under a hundred meters away. They were guarding the exit back to safety. Mike swore and slammed on the brakes. Run them down! Run them down! Penny screamed, her voice full of hysterics. Penny, shut up! Shelly yelled back. The figures watched the vehicle come to a screeching halt. They stared at the Ford for a moment before both taking a synchronized step forward. The moment their legs hit the ground, Mike's radio sprang to life. It fluctuated between John Denver, Van Halen, and a flock of seagulls before resting on an aggressive, ear-piercing static that sounded like a distant wailing. It was a static that would burrow into your skull and never depart. The lights on Mike's dashboard started to fade along with his headlights. The bings wobbled towards the car, and the headlights turned to black, a perfect way to mask the intruder's approach. Fuck this, Mike yelled as he slammed the Ford in a reverse. Luckily, the old girl still had some life in her. He accelerated and looked out the rear window behind him. His view was blocked mostly by copious amounts of luggage, beer cases, and coolers but he could see just enough to not steer into a tree. The radio turned back to music. Some old Johnny Cash song began to play, and his dashboard lit up, followed by his headlights. 
He came to a bend in the road and put the car in drive, immediately pulling a U-turn. The vehicle accelerated and the tires wailed against the dirt as the SUV flew past the scenic view of St. Teresa. Mike was watching the road, but Shelley chanced a look at the street leading into town. She could see four more figures walking the lane. They hadn't started up the hill yet, but they would no doubt reach the top in no time. She looked to the lake and saw that the lights had returned to the sky. Six of them this time. They were even lower and brighter than before. Her view was cut off as the tree line filled the driver's side windows. Shelley decided she wouldn't say anything. It would just scare the others, especially Penny. Before long, they passed a sign that displayed Markov's Point, 30 miles. Mike knew there was little chance they would be able to make it past the town with the gaslight already on, but he kept this to himself. He would drive until they had no more fuel. He didn't want to scare the others, especially Shelley. The road to Markov's Point was full of bends and twists that seemed to occur at random. The asphalt was poorly maintained and overgrown. It looked like it had been years since someone had driven down it. Leaves and branches littered the highway from various storms. No one had bothered to clean them up. It was apparent even the locals didn't like to come this way. A disconcerting thought. The words the stranger had said echoed around Mike's skull haunting him. Whatever you do, do not stop in Markov's Point for any reason. Multiple miles passed before Shelley said something under her breath. It was distant, but the fear in her voice was clear. What the hell is that? Mike scanned the road ahead, just sticks and leaves. Then he looked to the escarpment, the same escarpment that started to box the road in on the other side. A person, a man by the looks of it, stood in the tree line on the top of the cliff. He was naked and watched the SUV drive by. A toothy grin was plastered on his face. Mike stepped on the gas and swerved around a fallen tree, swearing as he did so. Mike looked in the rearview mirror and saw that Penny was in a deep, stress-induced sleep. She hadn't seen the man, which he was thankful for. She would have yelled and put the other two in an even higher state of alert. The adrenaline and the stress knocked her out, Mike thought. Shelley looked to Mike and pulled on his sleeve. He looked at her and followed her fingers as she pointed up the road. A group of people stood on the right side of the escarpment. Four of them, men and women, all clothed this time. The women had smiles etched on their faces, but the men, they frowned. Their expressions looked so unnatural and cartoon-like, so exaggerated in their presentation. The people stood and watched the vehicle go by. Their torn up and ratty overalls clung to their bodies. That was the last of the people they saw for a few miles, at least the ones that Mike reported to Shelley. He had seen one more person just as the escarpment eased down and flattened out. A woman in the forest to his left. As he looked at her, she turned and sprinted farther into the woods. She was naked and ran like no one he had ever seen. She took long, clumsy strides like someone who had only watched a person sprint from afar and was unsure how to replicate it convincingly. He shuddered, just thinking about it. A few miles after Mike saw the woman, they passed a sign that read, Welcome to Sunny Markov's Point, your escape to nature since 1890. As they passed the sign, Mike saw something moving in the distance. The vehicle's headlights illuminated a naked man walking down the side of the road away from the vehicle. As the SUV got closer to him, Shelley gasped 
Carlos! Penny yelled. Mike slammed on the brakes and felt the vehicle come to a skidding halt. No, Penny, don't! Shelly called out. She tried to grab her friend's shirt, but it was too late. The overhead lights came on as Penny flung open her door and went out into the night. She ran up to Carlos and hugged him. Carlos stopped walking and glanced down at her. Mike went to call out to Penny, to scream her name, but when he looked to the field on the right, he saw them. Ten people. Some were naked, some were clothed, but all were smiling, sprinting at full speed, charging through the field. They would be at the car in a matter of seconds. Mike stepped on the gas, and the tires squealed. No, Mike! Don't leave her! Mike, don't! Shelly yelled. She tried to seize the steering wheel, but he grabbed her hand and pinned it to her body. Mike looked in the rearview mirror and watched as Carlos started to shake violently. Penny separated herself from him and took a step back. His arms broke first, followed by his spine. He retched forward but continued to stand. Then his neck snapped. Mike could tell Penny was screaming, but the engine silenced her cries. She turned to run away just as Carlos's legs broke. Then Carlos wasn't Carlos anymore. Mike looked away as Penny was pulled backwards into the night. Shelley sobbed. At first it was because Mike had left Penny behind. Then it was because of the images burned in her brain. She had seen how Carlos changed into something unspeakable. How her friend had been ripped away like that. The people. Their exaggerated faces. The same fate would have awaited Mike and herself if they had stayed. The car died less than ten minutes later. It lurched several times before sputtering as it sucked up the last of the fuel. Mike guided it to the side of the road and coasted it until it came to a stop. He slammed his head against the steering wheel and held it there. Shelley put her hand out to comfort him. When she turned to look over his arched back, she saw they had stopped directly in front of a T intersection. The blood left her face as she realized they were sitting directly in front of a town. Markov's Point. She could see what looked like a school, a gas station, a supermarket, a fast food joint. All right where they should be, but not a single light was on in the entire town. Mike sensed Shelley was staring at something and followed her line of sight. Shit. He said, the one place he said not to stop. Shelley rubbed his back and said, There's no way we're going into that town. Not to look for gas, not for nothing. Her voice was commanding and stern. Yeah, no way, Mike answered, still staring into the town. What if we stay here till morning, maybe? With those grinning freaks running around, Shelley said cutting Mike off mid-sentence. No way. I'm not staying here. They could control your car again, remember? Like the radio and the lights? They could just do that with the locks or smash your windows. No way, Mike. Well, what do we do then? We run as fast as we can, making as little noise as possible. As she spoke, she pointed up the road ahead of them. At least we might have a chance. Did you pack any weapons? A knife or something? Your dad hunts? You said the cottage was fully furnished with a complete kitchen, Mike responded as he looked into the back seat of the vehicle, praying he would find some sort of sharp object sitting under the seat. I didn't think... Not even a Swiss army knife? Shelley asked rhetorically, already knowing the answer. Shelley double knotted her shoes unzipped her sweater and watched as Mike did the same. They looked at each other and Shelley nodded. They opened up the car doors 
and the overhead lights came on. Mike quickly turned them off, hoping not to give away their position, but realized the headlights of the car had probably already done that. He turned off the vehicle and pocketed the keys, hoping they would find some gas and be back tomorrow, hopefully with a sheriff or someone with a very large gun. Shelly moved to the front of the Ford, and Mike joined her. She reached out for his hand, and they jogged down the road. They ran a mile before Mike insisted they slow down. Shelly wanted to keep going, but Mike was out of breath, having had too many Miller lights that summer. They walked for another mile before Mike saw a farmhouse sitting on the right side of the road. A single porch light was on over the front door. Mike looked at Shelly and was about to speak when she cut him off. No, 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 no. Not a goddamn chance. We keep walking. He told us not to stop for any reason. I was just going to look quick for a gas can or... I'm not waiting for you. You go in there and I'm gone. This is what they want. For us to go in there. Maybe there is some gas, maybe there isn't, but they found the car by now either way. They'll be waiting. Mike went to argue, but held his tongue. Something was off with how dark the rest of the farmhouse looked. Only the one porch light was on. No other signs of life. It was suspicious, and the old barn that loomed behind it looked like something out of a horror movie Mike had seen as a child. A barn full of human skin and loud farm equipment caked in blood. Mike and Shelley walked down the road in front of the silent farmhouse. They didn't utter a word and watched it cautiously as they passed. No movement, just a still house with one porch light on. Mike breathed a sigh of relief when they managed to get down the road and were almost completely past the house. Then he heard it, a flapping of wings. Mike looked to the barn and saw a flock of crows take flight. The sound was immediately followed by the slow creak of a barn door. Shelley looked behind her and felt a cool breeze running across the untamed wheat fields. She watched as the barn door swung open. They were coming. <laughs> 